with other young people seeking solutions to their generation's biggest challenges. Micah Massent was Métis and he supported the Moose Hide campaign to end violence against women and children. Now his mother sews hearts onto Moose Hide pins in his memory. The 737 MAX is a structurally flawed aircraft that Boeing tried to fix with software. Micah's family don't want to see these planes ever cleared to fly again. The Honourable Member for Newmarket, Aurora. Mr. Speaker, on International Women's Day, I renewed my commitment to ensure that every girl and woman in Newmarket, Aurora, across Canada and around the world has the potential to reach their full potential. I'm always optimistic about our future when I meet young people interested in politics. And today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Farah Ahmed from my riding to the Hill as part of the University of Toronto Women in the House program. During her studies, Farah developed a passion for meaningful local politics, and while on her reading week this fall, she chose to spend her free time volunteering in the campaign that brought me here today. So thank you, Farah, for joining me today and your commitment to our campaign and to our community. Congratulations to all the program participants here today, and best of luck to you in your future. And I hope to see you all back here one day as women in the House. Here, here. Honourable Member for Brendan Source. I rise today to pay tribute to Mr. Art Enns, who recently passed away after a brief battle with cancer. Art was an icon in the agriculture industry, a passionate advocate for farmers and a true philanthropist. He was a strong supporter of marketing freedom. Art never wavered in his beliefs that farmers should have the freedom to market their own wheat and barley as they saw fit. From being the president of the Western Canadian Wheat Growers Association in the late 90s to becoming the president of the Prairie Oat Growers, he was no stranger to members of parliament. His tireless and unwavering enthusiasm in those lobby missions across the prairies and here in Ottawa was a testament of his devotion to the agriculture industry. Art was instrumental in opening new markets and was always at the table to ensure the voice of farmers was heard loud and clear. On behalf of all who knew him, rest in peace, dear friend. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Alfred Pellin. Mr. Speaker, Sunday, March 8th, we celebrated International Women's Day. Although we still have a long way to go, progress for equality between women and men is measurable and visible. Women excel in every sphere, from art to technology, from sport to medical research, from education to business. Women are striving. The sky is the limit. Je pense à l'histoire de Vicky Vaillancourt. I'm thinking of Vicky Vaillancourt, who took on the family farm. It's the only business that specializes in citrus that grows in Quebec. Evolve in the mechanical engineering industry and the manufacturing of precision parts for machinery. These women set an example that professions and jobs have no gender. Passion and perseverance is all you need. Mesdames, où que vous soyez. Ladies, wherever you are, I raise my hat to you. Thank you for being yourselves, for being women. The Honorable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, from February 27 to 29, it was the third year of Drummondville's Rendezvous Québec Cinéma. It's a source of pride to be able to offer this window into our filmmakers a side event to Montreal's own event. This demonstrates that our city and our region are not only leaders in business and in economic development, but also a place where culture is valued, where artists can express themselves before an open and interested public. The event in Drummondville almost didn't happen this year because of a lack of funding. The mother of a young actor, Édouard biron Larocque, my friend Geneviève Biron, alerted me to the situation and that launched her call to action among elected officials, business people, and the media. Everyone understands that a nation that doesn't defend its culture is condemning itself to disappear. I would like to congratulate Annie Amel, the general director of Capital Cinema, the owners of RGFM Cinemas, Guillaume and Frederick Venn, who worked extremely hard to ensure the event's survival. All together, we'll make sure that Rendezvous Quebec Cinema has its place in Drummondville for a long time to come. Thank you. Honourable member for Tokyo Centre. One of 
my mentor speaker is Donna Cansfield, the former MPP in Etobicoke Centre. And she once said to me, Yvonne, the most important job of a politician is not to talk, it's to listen. Yeah, yeah. Because when you listen, you understand what people's priorities are, you understand their challenges, and you acquire knowledge on how to solve those challenges. Etobicoke Centre has per capita one of the largest populations of seniors of any riding in Canada. So I spend a lot of time trying to address the challenges that seniors face and I also spend a lot of time listening to seniors. When I was an MPP, I hosted a monthly seniors advisory group meeting to learn about and discuss how we can address the challenges that seniors face in my community. And as the MP for Etobicoke Centre, I've started to hold those meetings once again. And the turnout so far has been fantastic. We've had over 100 seniors come to each of our first two meetings. So I'd like to thank the seniors who've come out so far and contributed to those meetings. And I'd like to encourage and invite all seniors in Etobicoke Centre to join me at my future meetings I'm eager to address the challenges that you face. I'm eager to listen. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Charlebault, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, the people in my riding of Charlebault, Haute Saint Charles, have questions for the Prime Minister. First of all, they want to know why he seems disinterested in issues of security. Since 2017, they've seen him welcome thousands of illegal migrants with open arms. Every day, his government welcomes them but does nothing to stop the problem. It's clear for the public that I represent that this Liberal government doesn't understand the concept of borders. Currently, anyone can get around our immigration system, while those who apply legally have to wait even longer. Over the last month, my fellow citizens have seen the same government allow criminals to block railroads and to derail the economy. Many Canadians lost their jobs and Canadian safety was imperiled. My voters want to know why. My voters are also worried about this government's decision about whether indecision about whether to prohibit Huawei's involvement in the 5G network. They know that the, this communist regime spies and steals regularly Canadian intellectual property, but they see no action from this government to protect them. They feel abandoned and want to know why. Mr. Speaker, today is Tampon Tuesday. That's right, Mr. Speaker, it's time to talk about menstrual products. Tampon Tuesday is a national initiative that encourages Canadians to donate menstrual products to those in need. Period poverty is a problem facing nearly one quarter of menstruating Canadians. These Canadians struggle to buy enough menstrual products every month, often due to economic circumstances which force them to prioritize food or housing over buying pads or tampons. These challenges have led to menstrual hygiene products being one of the most items at, uh, re requested items at donation centers like the food bank. Sadly, Mr. Speaker, they're also one of the least donated. This campaign, led by the United States, Way, started in 2009 and has seen donations of over 330,000 boxes of feminine hygiene products over the years. But there is still work to be done, Mr. Speaker. There is still more need. So let's not pad the truth, Mr. Speaker. We have been going with the flow for far too long, and it's time to work together to create a country where menstrual products are openly accessible to all. Period. Full member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. When we talk about and take action on advancing the rights of women and girls in Canada and across the world, we do it with the knowledge that when society empowers women, we improve governance, we decrease conflict, we increase stability, we improve economic performance, we boost food security and health, we have better environmental protection and better social progress for everyone. This year, as we celebrated International Women's Day, we recognize the trailblazers who've been pushing that needle further towards progress for all of humanity. Mr. Speaker, women's rights are human rights, and activism for women and girls, such as celebrating International Women's Day, is really about advancing the whole of humanity, and we all have a part to play. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bravo. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Riverbend. Mr. Speaker, members of the ALS Society of Canada are on Parliament Hill today to spread awareness about the disease. This year alone, approximately 1,000 Canadians will learn they have ALS and another 1,000 Canadians will die from the disease. This disease affects the motor neurons that carry signals between our brains and muscles. Over time, a person suffering from ALS will lose the ability to walk, talk, eat, swallow and eventually breathe. The care responsibility for, uh, for ALS patients takes a huge emotional, financial and psychological toll on patients and their families. 
There is no cure for ALS and few treatment options for people living with the disease. Today has been an opportunity to better understand ALS. Thank you to the ALS Society of Canada for their continued advocacy efforts to find a treatment and eventual cure for the disease. Like them, I would like to live in a world without ALS. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Markham, Scobler. To recognize U of T Women in the House, founded in 2013. It is a program aimed at promoting greater female representation in the federal government by inviting students to shadow a Canadian parliamentarian for a day on the Hill. It is a non partisan and bi bilingual program co founded by Dr. Tina Park and the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. In celebration of the 2020 International Women's Day Week, 100 female students from the University of Toronto are on the Hill today shadowing an MP or Senator. The students who range from first-year undergraduates to PhD students will be witnessing the political process close up and networking with politicians. And I'm so pleased to have students here from my alma mater, including my shadow, Keshna Sood, who I feel sure will be a future leader. I want to thank the participants and all hosts across the political spectrum who are helping champion and empower our next generation. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, today marks the 61st anniversary of the Tibetan National Uprising Day. We mark 61 years of resistance to the communist occupation of Tibet, the land of snows. Tibetan resistance has a unique character. Tibetans do not desire recrimination or division, and they do not respond to their oppression with violence. They desire reconciliation, a middle way which allows Tibet genuine autonomy within the framework of the Chinese constitution. They build, they love, and they will outlast. In their resistance, Tibetans model the immortal words of Martin Luther King Jr., who said, We shall match your capacity to inflict suffering with our capacity to endure suffering. We shall meet your physical force with soul force. The deep spirituality and endurance of the Tibetan soul force will overcome the mere physical force of aimless dialectical materialism. This year, the Communist Party introduced a new draconian ethnic unity law to eradicate virtually all of the distinctive elements of Tibetan identity. But we celebrate today that even under the growing oppression which the land of the snows endures, the Tibetan spirit is as strong as ever inside Tibet, in Dharamsala, here in Canada and around the world. Pogelo! The Honourable Member for Mission Maskey Fraser Canyon. Mr. Speaker, the Federal Prison Needle Exchange Program provides clean needles to drug addicted inmates so they can inject illegal substances that have been smuggled into our prisons. Needles are provided confidentially to inmates to do drugs in their cells. How can this possibly be a good idea? Prison is meant to be punishment. Convicted individuals' illegal drug habits should not be catered to by federal correctional institutions. And the Prison Needle Exchange Program doesn't affect inmates alone. It puts our corrections officers' personal safety at substantial risk. The Union of Canadian Correctional Officers is rightly and adamantly opposed to the needle exchange program. Why is this government not listening to those on the front lines who have been clear the current program does very little with respect to harm reduction? Why does this Liberal government place more value on the illegal drug abuse of inmates over the safety of our corrections officers? The Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. Today I rise in honour of International Women's Day. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, it is with great respect that I wish to highlight the 40th anniversary of Info Femme, an essential organization anchored in the local feminist community, which has essential expertise about Mercier Est in La Pointe de Lille. Since 1980, this organization has allowed over 50,000 women to meet, to share, and to acquire tools. Info Femme promotes better mental and physical health, as well as empowerment that leads women on the path to becoming more independent. I would like to congratulate them on their recent initiatives commemorating, preventing, and raising awareness about domestic violence after the femicides that occurred in the east of Montreal. Thank you to the coordinator, Annick Paradis, the advocate, Linda Basque, and the entire team of volunteers for their invaluable work and their contribution to a movement, to a collective vision of equality 
justice and fairness for all. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Mr. Speaker, in the last Parliament, this government enjoyed the good fortune of a booming global economy, and they squandered it with wasteful spending, massive deficits, and broken promises. Shameful. They failed to deliver their public infrastructure program, and major private infrastructure projects like pipelines were either cancelled or had to be nationalized. Canada's economic growth was grinding to a halt before the illegal blockades, before the outbreak of coronavirus, before the stock market crashed, and before oil prices went into freefall. Right. For four years, my constituents have watched this government dither its way into massive structural deficits while ignoring thousands of unemployed energy workers. And now we face blockades, coronavirus, a global downturn, and a catastrophic drop in oil prices, all on top of an already weakening Canadian economy. This government is hopelessly ill-prepared for the gathering economic storm. My constituents want national leadership, and they find none from this government. The Honourable Member for Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Mr. Speaker, I am rising in the House today to recognize the advocacy work that ALS Canada does on behalf of all patients affected by this terrible illness. Losing a friend to ALS is a difficult experience that I went through in 2016. Many of you knew him, the Honorable Moril Bélanger. We know that this illness affects over 3,000 Canadians every single day. That is why... ...with ALS, hence why it is so important for this community to continue, continue to advocate until we make this terrible disease a treatable one. I want to thank all the MPs and Senators who took and will take meetings today with ALS Canada. I want to thank those who are diagnosed with ALS but are here today to advocate on behalf of other patients. Mainly, thank you, Carol, Stephanie, and Norm. You are tireless advocates. But to those who have left, left us, like my friend Eddie and Maril, know that I, and along with many colleagues in this place, will continue to advocate until we make ALS a treatable disease. Question oral, oral questions. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, four and a half years ago, the Liberals were re-elected by saying that they would run three small deficits and then balance the books. The reality is that there were four big deficits for a total of seventy billion dollars. They did not respect their commitment, and worse still, for four and a half years, 200,000 Canadian jobs were lost in the energy sector, and many investments have been lost. The rail crisis took them more than a month to solve because they dragged their heels. So we can see clouds uh, on the economic horizon. What is the government going to do because it's gotten rid of its buffer? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker. For four years, we've invested in communities, invested in workers, invested in the Canadian economy. And this is paying off. Not only a million Canadians have been lifted out of poverty, but can, we've seen more than a million new jobs in recent years. Our economy is growing. We have opportunities for many more people. But we realize that with the coronavirus, there are economic ch challenges on the horizon. And that is why we've kept some leeway to be able to invest in Canadians. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Four and a half years ago, when they were elected, their house was in order. They had a surplus. They had the be best GDP to debt ratio. And they had. Uh, ec economic growth, and that was the trinity that we left them. But today, there's no buffer left. How come they spent all this money when we should have saved when we were in full economic growth worldwide? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. We remember the Conservatives' approach. They cut services to veterans. They cut public health. They eliminated health services for the most vulnerable Canadians and refugees. We've chosen to invest, and we've seen economic growth as a result. And we did keep a buffer for difficult times like now, and we'll be able to help entrepreneurs, help workers, and help Canadians to face this crisis that is the coronavirus. For 
deficit? Well, they're running a $27 billion deficit before the coronavirus uh, crisis kicked off. And what did that buy us? Higher unemployment than the UK, the US, Japan, and Germany. Half of Canadians with within $200 of insolvency. A $150 billion in cancelled projects. And in the last three months of last year, our economy ground to a halt with 0.3% economic growth. How could so much money buy so little? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Question Canadians were asking themselves in 2015 because Stephen Harper and the Conservatives added over $150 billion to the national debt with nothing to show for it. We made the decision to invest in Canadians instead, put more money in the pockets of middle class. And what did we get? A million Canadians lifted out of poverty, over a million jobs created. What did they do? Cuts to services for veterans, cuts to health care, cuts to things that Canadians need. We we now have room to maneuver to invest in the Canadian economy because of coronavirus. That's what we chose to do, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Carlton. Instead of defending his record, he states falsehoods about our record. There were two Conservative budgets prior to the Great Global Recession. And let's look at those budgets. 20, 2006, according to the public accounts, a $13.8 billion surplus. 2007, delivered again by Jim Flaherty, a $9.6 billion surplus. Conservatives did the responsible thing and paid off debt to cushion us against the hard times that were to come, and that's why we had the strongest response to the great global recession. Why did he spend the cupboard bare in the good times and leave us so weak and vulnerable now in the hard times? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, the member opposite asks a good question. Why? Why did we invest in Canadians? Why did we put more money in the pockets of the middle class? Because we knew it would create growth for Canadians. It would lift millions of people out of poverty. It would support families and seniors. It would grow our economy by investing in infrastructure that they had neglected for a decade, Mr. Speaker. Our investments have created growth that gives us the room to maneuver now, and we have the firepower to be able to invest in our economy given the coronavirus challenge, Mr. Speaker. That's the, the Honourable Member for Carlton. So the roughly yeah, half yeah. of Canadians who were within $200 of insolvency before the coronavirus crisis hit would disagree that he invested in them. He says that we neglected to give $12 million to Loblaws. He's right that we neglected to give $50 million to MasterCard. He's right about that, too. He is right that we neglected to give money to the big, well-connected corporate insiders whom he has favoured with his deficit spending over the last four years. Mr. Speaker, is he now setting the stage to fill the coffers of his friends, to bloat the government, and to balloon the deficit with all of his rhetoric today? Yeah. Conservatives neglected to invest in our veterans by shuttering nine veterans service centers. They neglected to invest in health care for our most vulnerable by shutting down refugee health care. Mr. Speaker, we made the decision to invest in Canadians and have reduced poverty more than any other government, lifting a million Canadians out of poverty over these past years, Mr. Speaker. And we did it because we know that investing in Canadians, investing for our future by supporting the middle class and people working hard to, to, uh, to join it is exactly what Canadians need from a government. The Honourable Member for Berlay chambly Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are worrisome circumstances, aside from the economy, could have an impact on Quebec's economy. But the Minister of Finance said that Given this circumstance, we could be stepping back from election promises. And I think we have to do just the opposite. We have to support Quebecers and Canadians' purchasing power, notably seniors who are the most vulnerable in this crisis. Is the Prime Minister ready to commit to improve the purchasing power of seniors who are over 65 years of age? Since the beginning of our government five years ago, we 
decided to invest in our seniors by increasing the GIS for the most vulnerable of them, by helping students also by increasing grants. We're helping fam families by creating the Canada Child Benefit. We realize that there's a challenge ahead for our workers, our seniors, our entrepreneurs with the coronavirus, and we'll be there to help them in difficult times. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly, Mr. Speaker, the track record, well, we look at that during election campaigns, but now we're talking about the future and the short-term future because we're just a few months away, weeks away from the budget. We don't want to send an alarming me message, but the Canadian government is not really sending out a message, and it doesn't seem to be doing very much compared to Quebec, which has taken concrete action to reassure people. Can he at least tell us, uh, send a, a clear message to the most vulnerable people in this situation, the seniors? Can he guarantee them that as of 65 years of age, he'll support their purchasing power, the right honourable prime minister? The government has always been there to act for our seniors, and that's why we've been able to increase the GIS to help the most vulnerable seniors. We've invested in housing, we've invested in home care, and we're taking care of our seniors, and we'll continue to do so in the future challenges with the coronavirus. We'll be there for our seniors like we're there to support all vulnerable peoples across the country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For New Westminster, Burnaby. These experts, these experts. Experts in health have told people to stay home if they're sick, but for those who don't have sick leave, this could allow them to lose pay or even their jobs. The, we've known about this crisis for weeks. Finance Minister announced was that he'd be making an announcement. Empty words from the Liberals don't help these workers pay their bills. No firepower there. These workers are trying to make the right choices for public health. When will the Prime Minister actually deliver? Here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're very aware that many workers and families across the country are worried about the impacts of coronavirus uh, as, they, as they impact the global economy and, indeed, the Canadian economy. That is why uh, we will be announcing measures to help our workers, to help help Canadians right across the country as things uh, evolve with the coronavirus. We are following the best recommendations of experts both in the health and medical sectors, but also in the financial sector to ensure uh, that Canadians have the capacity to get through this with confidence. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. The Minister of Labour said they're not hearing from workers who can't afford to stay home. Well, I say get out of the boardrooms and talk to the workers on the streets in our communities. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, BC has his first case of community transmission, and yesterday we had our first death due to COVID-19. To protect the health and safety of Canadians, BC Medical Health Officer has asked Canada to delay our cruise season. Can the Prime Minister confirm that he will accept this advice, and exactly what support will he be providing for the workers and the businesses? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning, we've been coordinating very closely with pre provincial governments like the government of BC to ensure uh, that we're doing everything we can to keep our citizens safe and to protect businesses. Uh, we recognize there's going to be an impact on tourism industries uh, because of the coronavirus. That is why we're working with provinces and with various sectors to ensure that we're supporting Canadians through difficult times. We need to keep Canadians and their families safe. We need to ensure that people can put food on their table and pay their rent. That is what this government is focused on, and it is what we will be able to do for Canadians. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. Before COVID-19 hit, oil prices tanked and markets tumbled, this Prime Minister was setting the stage for Canada to fail. As soon as he was elected, he set out to do two things. One, kill our energy sector, and two, spend as much as possible. Well, congratulations, Prime Minister. Mission accomplished. Today, over $150 billion in energy capital has left, over 200,000 jobs gone, and another $100 billion added to the debt. So when will the Prime Minister finally stop inflicting such damage on this country? Here, here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Oh, sorry. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, yeah. Selective use of memory is simply astounding. If I look back to the Harper government's record, I'll note that they added $150 billion to the national debt and had the slowest rate of economic growth since the Great Depression. Over the past four and a half years, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to continue. When we took office four and a half years ago, we started making the kinds of investments that would trigger economic growth. What have the results been? 1.2 million jobs added to the Canadian economy, yeah, yeah. including more than 30,000 just in the past month. Wow. We've also made sure that the benefits of the growth that we're seeing actually land on the kitchen tables of families. More than 1 million Canadians are not living in poverty today that were four and a half years ago. This is the kind of growth that we should trigger, growth that works for everyone. That's right. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. One of the worst unemployment rates in the G7. Investment has dried up in this country. Our dollar is down. We don't even know the impact of COVID-19 on the world economy, much less the Canadian economy. Newsflash, Mr. Speaker, things are not going well. And if the Prime Minister wants to blame somebody, he better stop blaming Stephen Harper. Look in the mirror, because he's to blame for the situation we are in right now. So when is the Prime Minister going to finally admit he has done massive damage to our economy? Things are not well and things need to change. Mr. Speaker, the feigned sanctimony coming from the Conservatives on these issues is simply difficult to accept. The, uh, the facts that they rely, rely upon are not facts at all. Canada does not have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the G7. In fact, the unemployment rate in Canada today is lower not only than at any point during the Conservatives' term in office, but at any point in the past 40 years since we started keeping track of those statistics. Conservatives were operating in an echo chamber and actually looked to facts, science and evidence that would realize that the economy has been growing at a rate that would make the Conservatives jealous. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Le Fjord. Demand for LNG is rising constantly worldwide. By 2040 even, we expect demand to double. And our European allies are seeking to phase out coal and to step away from Russian natural gas. The GNL Quebec project perfectly met this, and it was a green project that would have attracted investment, jobs, taxes, and economic diversification. What does the government plan to do to establish winning commissions for such a project to take place in Canada and, Co and Quebec? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government is committed to working with the natural resource sector to ensure that the best projects are undertaken to ensure jobs and lasting growth. We understand that GNL Quebec plans to continue the evaluation process, even though it's seeking a new investor for its proposed project. The Honourable Member for Megantique. Not only has this government played the grasshopper, but it hasn't saved anything for tough times. Its policies and inaction have driven investors away. If people like Warren Buffett have decided to snub Canada with their billions at a time when everything was going fine, what will happen now that the entire planet is facing a major crisis? Well, this Liberal government can t tell us what they'll do to get us out of this crisis that they have put it in with its out-of-control spending. Mr. Speaker, with respect, the fiscal health of Canada remains very strong today. Our debt-to-GDP ratio is, in fact, the strongest of any G7 economy. That's right. This is the case because we're making the kinds of investments that allow us to experience economic growth. Our debt is shrinking as a function of our economy. We are one of only two countries in the G7 that has the AAA credit rating from all the major credit agencies. Mr. Speaker, we've been able to make the kinds of investments that allow us to experience economic growth, add more than 1.2 million jobs to the economy, and protect our fiscal position to make sure that we have the room to respond to the kinds of challenges that are now emerging as a result of global circumstances. A member for Lethbridge. Today we learned that the Synovus is cutting spending by 32 percent and waiting to decide on whether or not they should invest further in our country. This is another devastating blow to the province of Alberta. 
Add to this cancelled investment from tech, add to that cancelled investment from Warren Buffett, and it's clear that Canada's energy sector is in a huge crisis. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister stands idly by doing absolutely nothing and not taking it seriously. Energy companies are forced to make drastic changes just to survive. What will the Prime Minister do in order to get Alberta back on track? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government remains fully committed to working with the resource sector in Canada to ensure that we move forward with the best projects and they're carried out to create jobs and economic opportunity for all Canadians. We know that in Canada and around the world, global investors and consumers are increasingly looking for the cleanest products available in sustainable resource development. We fully intend to be working actively with the province of Alberta and Saskatchewan and other provinces around the country to ensure that we continue to move forward in the right way. The Honourable Member for Barrie Innisfil. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that every Canadian is now vulnerable because of this Prime Minister. Even before <laughs> the coronavirus, he spent the cupboards bare, adding billions in new debt and billions in deficits. Our economy had stalled to near zero growth and $150 billion in nation-building projects, and the revenues that go with them had left Canada, including Warren Buffett pulling $4 billion out of a Quebec energy project, instead of blaming others or a virus. Why won't the Prime Minister admit to Canadians that his weak leadership, his poor decisions, have put Canada on the perilous fiscal cliff we're on right now? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, th this narrative coming from the Conservative has absolutely no basis in reality. I'll uh, read a quote from the economist Kevin Milligan from the University of British Columbia who said, any notion that the fiscal cupboard is bare is irrefutably, absolutely, 100%, 180 degrees wrong. If we want to talk about cupboards being bare, let's talk about the cupboards of 1 million Canadians that were living in poverty with bare cupboards a few years ago. Let's talk about the cupboards that were bare of 300,000 Canadian children who were living in poverty a few years ago. Let's talk about the cupboards that were bare of 1.2 2 million Canadians that did not have a job a few years ago that are working today. Mr. Speaker, the measures we're putting in place are growing the economy, creating jobs, and making sure the Canadians who need help are receiving the help they need. The Honourable Member for St. Jean. Mr. Speaker, the day before yesterday in Lacolle, customs officers suspect, suspected there was someone arriving from New York by train with the coronavirus. What did they do? They called the first responders from the nearest municipality in Lacolle without telling them it was a potential coronavirus case. And there was no protocol to be followed at customs, even after Health Canada was contacted. There was still no response. Custom officers had no adequate physical protection. My question is simple. Is there a protocol? And if so, how come no one at the border is aware of it? There are public safety. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I'd, I'd like to advise the member that there are, in fact, border, border measures in place. And in fact, just last week, we have implemented right across Canada at all our land, rail, and marine ports of entry new, new uh, regulations and requirements for our border officers to ask questions regarding, regarding the virus. And that information is shared with Public Health Canada and with first responders in the regions that are affected. The Honourable Member for Avignon, La Matisse, Matan Matapidia. Mr. Speaker, the Governor of New York has declared a state of emergency because of the coronavirus. Hundreds of people from the state are crossing our border by bus and train every day. Agents on the ground at border crossings here have said that there is an outright improvisation with respect to security. Will the government immediately inform customs officers and first responders at border cities about the protocol to be followed in case of coron coronavirus, if there is a protocol? Is he going to give them the necessary protection and reimburse the associated costs? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, the health and safety of Canadians is our first priority. And the Canada Border Service Agency continues to work closely under the leadership of Public Health Canada and, and, and our public health agency to ensure that all appropriate border measures are in place and reflective of the risk to Canada and CBSA employees. Enhanced screening and detection processes have been added, as I've said, to all international airports as well as land, border, ferry and rail ports of entries. Mr. Speaker, our officers stand ready to do their part to keep Canadians safe and they have the tools to assist in this public health crisis. I take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to thank them for their service. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Riverbend. Mr. Speaker, it's vital that the public have confidence in their health care system and feel that Canada is prepared for a potential COVID-19 outbreak. 
as provinces and hospitals warn that they are not prepared, action by this government needs to be taken. We know COVID-19 doesn't respect borders and the list of high-risk countries continues to grow. Is the government prepared to consider expanding vigorous screening measures, mandatory quarantine and stopping incoming flights from these new areas? Member of Parliament for being so engaged on this file and he himself said in his question that this virus knows no borders and I think it's very incumbent on all of us to remember that this virus is about uh, is about it, it spreads from person to person quite easily we have cases as you know here in Canada there are cases in 104 countries as of now the measures we've taken at the border are targeted they're based on evidence mr. speaker and they are in a, done in a manner to protect the health and safety of Canadians and focus our public health resources where they can best do so Thank you. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, saint charles The Customs Officers Union is concerned by the lack of Health Canada personnel at airports. Public Health Agency says that it has taken every measure possible to minimize this crisis, but Mr. Fortin, the union's president, has contradicted this by saying that there's nothing on the ground. For now, Canada is faring well, but we know that, like other regions of the world, the number of cases will certainly rise. Who's telling the truth, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister or border experts? Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me be very clear. The Canadian Border Service Agency has been working very closely with the Public Health Agency of Canada and with Health Canada to ensure that all of the appropriate borders are, measures are in place and that we are supporting CBSA officers as, as they do the important job. Mr. Speaker, I've spoken to the head of, of the CBSA union, Mr. Fortan, on a number of occasions. I've asked him if he had any concerns. We've discussed this very extensively, and we have made sure that our officers are ready to do their job. They are equipped with the tools that they need to assist in this public health crisis and equipped with, with the measures and the tools to keep them safe while they do their jobs. Number four, Oshawa. Mr. Speaker, while the Prime Minister is literally playing on his cell phone, Canadians are concerned with the rapid spread of COVID-19. The CBC is reporting that a traveller from northern Italy landed in Toronto without being screened. David Gosin said that, quote, Nobody did a temperature check. There was nothing, really. Can the minister tell us why travelers from high-risk areas like Italy are being allowed to enter Canada without any, any screening? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will say that uh, we are filing, following science and evidence in a way that is protecting the lives of Canadians. This is, uh, it is of utmost importance that the measures that we put into place actually will have the most effectiveness in protecting Canadians' wellness and safety. That is exactly what we've done, Mr. Speaker. We haven't done that alone. This is with best scientific uh, evidence from Canada through partnership with the World Health Organization recommendations. And, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to do what's right for Canadians all across this country. Thank Thank you. Member for South Surrey, White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My daughter and family live directly across from Lynn Valley Care Centre in BC, where a resident has died of COVID-19. One of the centre's infected health care workers was BC's first case of community transmission, not due to travel or contact with a known carrier. BC's health officer stated this is one of the scenarios we have been most concerned about. Will this Liberal government ensure that travellers from high-risk countries and Entering Canada undergo vigorous screening processes and mandatory quarantine upon entry. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, that the case that the member opposite is referring to would not have been detected under mandatory quarantining or anything at the border because, in fact, it was a case of community transmission. Our heart goes out to the people of the nursing home who have been affected, in particular to the family of the person who's lost their life. It is important to recognize that the province of BC is actively involved in containing this illness by detecting cases, by sampling and testing uh, individuals in communities that are affected, by making sure they have full knowledge of what's happening in communities. I want to thank the hard-working public health officials and health officials in general who are doing this hard work for us. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Mr. Speaker, Canada's hospitals are warning they are at risk of losing control of the COVID-19 outbreak. And now doctors are sounding the alarm over the shortage of ventilators mm. we'll need in the event of widespread infection. Yet, it was just yesterday that this government wrote to premiers to find out what their needs are. 
That is a failure of emergency preparedness. Mr. Speaker, when will this government release a detailed inventory of all medical resources that Canada needs to respond to a more severe outbreak? Yes. The Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister for echoing my letter to the Ministers of Health that uh, actually went out quite some time ago to ask them for advice in terms of what they think they will need to, to su supplement their, their, their supplies. Mr. Speaker, the Ministers of Health and I have been meeting for two and a half months, once a week, by teleconference, to ensure that we actually know what we need to do together. This is an important part of working together as a country. I am so thrilled with the support of the Ministers of Health from every province and territory who have made themselves available in such a comprehensive way so that we can ensure that we're working together to protect the health and safety of Canadians. On the Honourable Member for Churchill, Kwatnu. Mr. Speaker, today when I called on the Liberals to address the potential crisis of coronavirus on First Nations, they tried to shut me down. The government doesn't get it. They advise regular hand washing. How do you do that without running water? Yeah. They advise self-isolation. Impossible with a housing crisis of 12 to 20 people living in a home. And in places like the Island Lake region or Cross Lake, thousands of people and no hospital in sight. People are worried. So can a regular member of the Prime Minister's Coronavirus Committee please stand up and tell us what they're doing to ensure First Nations and Inuit communities are supported now? Yeah. The, Honourable member for, the Honourable Minister for Indigenous Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will remind the member opposite that in Budget 2019, way before the coronavirus broke out, we invested $79 million over five years to improve and prepare support for health emergencies and health-related impacts of natural disasters uh, and health disasters on reserve. This includes dedicated support for one health emergency management coordinator in every region and two coordinators in Ontario and Manitoba. We know that First Nations, Inuit, are, are susceptible and more vulnerable to coronavirus. We are prepared as a minister, as a ministry, to engage in surge activities should they be required. And let me say, Mr. Let me say, Mr. Speaker, we're ready to act and we're working closely with those communities in order to augment their capacity. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Lex de Louis. Mr. Speaker. Today, representatives from the Heart and Stroke Foundation are on Parliament Hill to meet and speak with members of Parliament about the Foundation's important work. These people advocate passionately for the health and well-being of Canadians. Can the Minister of Health tell the House what the government is doing to support this important organization that is doing such critical work for Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for Lac Saint Louis for his question. Stroke Foundation, because as the member says, of the important work they do to promote healthy lifestyles for Canadians, it's good for all of us. And since 2016, we've invested more than five million in heart and stroke to support programs like Activate and their work to better understand women's brain and heart health, building on the one and a half billion dollars that Heart and Stroke has invested in re into research since 1956. But we know that there's so much more to do, and I thank the Heart and Stroke for the work that they're doing to keep Canadians healthy and to make them healthier. My thanks to the member for his advocacy. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. The Prime Minister promised openness and transparency, but yesterday at the Ethics Committee, that proved to be more empty promises. The Liberals voted to shut down a study of the Trudeau Report too, but they couldn't do it alone. The Prime Minister made a deal with the Bloc Quebecois to prop up his minority. It's the return of the Liberal Bloc Coalition. The Prime Minister obstructed the investigation and muzzled witnesses. Canadians deserve the truth. What did the Prime Minister give the Bloc Québécois to cover up his corruption? Mr. Speaker, I hear a lot of excitement on the part of my colleagues opposite, uh, but I can tell you the Bloc Québécois can stand up for itself. House committees are independent, and they are masters of their own decisions. The Honourable Member for Lévis-Lodbinière. Mr. Speaker, twice at the Ethics Committee, the scheming bloc supported the government's cover-up and refused to invite the ethics commissioner, muzzle the ethics commissioner, by refusing to invite him on the matter of the prime minister's interference in a criminal case. Mr. Speaker, 
I would like to know what the Bloc Québécois got from the Liberal government in exchange for its despicable support for this scheme. The Honourable House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I realize my colleague is interested in the committee's work. I would invite him to read the rules and regulations that apply to committees, which say that committees are masters of their own fate. They make their own decisions. The Honourable Member for Richemont Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, on Budget Day in Quebec, caution is the word of the day in order to deal with an economic downturn. But here it's open bar. Five fifty million dollars for MasterCard, twelve million dollars for Loblaws to change its fridges, five thousand dollars for a few coat hooks, and fourteen thousand dollars for one TV. Now we know that the bloc supports this spending because it's voting with the government on its budget. Mr. Speaker, when will the Liberals and the bloc stop? playing buddies together on the backs of taxpayers by supporting such reckless spending. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, once again, I didn't think I would have to stand up in order to stand up for the bloc. They're perfectly capable of defending themselves and to answer those questions. So if they want to ask them that question, well, they can go outside and ask them the question outside the House. <laughs> The Honourable Government House Leader can continue. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But once again, questions about the House Committee should instead be dealt with by looking at the rules and regulations for committees because they make their own decisions. The Honourable Member for Richemont Athabasca. Mr. Speaker, last week, a Liberal leader invited the Bloc leader to a private meeting. Imagine a meeting with a leader who wants to separate from Canada with someone who voted against inviting the Ethics Commissioner to testify on a devastating report. So the Bloc supported this refusal to invite the Commissioner to testify about the Prime Minister. What did the Prime Minister offer the Bloc leader in order to buy his vote this time? The Honourable, leader, the Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, if my colleague is so interested in what the Bloc thinks, well, he can go and speak to them. Mr. Speaker, there's lots of room there, lots of places there, are bars. He can go have a beer with someone from the Bloc and ask the question himself. It, it is perfectly normal for leaders to speak with other leaders. It's responsible, and it's a responsible way to work in this parliament. The Honourable Member for Longueuil Saint Hubert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you'll see, I do have a serious question. We learned recently that $4.3 billion were spent under the National Housing Strategy. How much did Quebec get out of that? Zero. Nothing. Not a cent. Nothing at all. Mr. Speaker, there's still $1.4 billion left, but it's just lying dormant in the federal government's coffers. Mr. Speaker, Quebec is dealing with its worst housing crisis in 15 years. Will the government finally, unconditionally, transfer the money it is due and that is just sitting in Ottawa? The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, we want Quebecers to get their fair share of our historic investment in housing. And we hope to conclude a bilateral agreement with Quebec, as we have done with the other provinces and territories. The Honourable Member for Longueuil-Saint-Hubert. 
Mr. Speaker. When you can't find a place to live, you end up on the street. And this is in a country whose government brags repeatedly that it is lifting people out of poverty. But in this case, it's managing to keep thousands of Quebecers in poverty and even put them there. Mr. Speaker, $4.3 billion has already been granted for the rest of Canada, and Quebec has not been given a cent, simply because the federal government wants to set its own conditions. Mr. Speaker, when will it transfer the $1.4 billion that we need and that we paid for with our taxes? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know that we need to reach our housing targets, and that's impossible without the collaboration with our partners, the provinces and territories, including Quebec. We will continue to work at all levels of government in order to serve Canadians and in order to make sure that each and every Canadian has access to affordable housing. For Northumberland, Peterborough South. Normally, springtime is a time of rejuvenation and reinvigoration. However, for many residents in the Great Lakes shoreline, it is a time of anxiety and worry. With record high water levels, they are concerned about flooding destroying their houses, which they've all worked so hard for. Could the Prime Minister please inform the House what actions this government is taking to protect residents along the shoreline of the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence, and the Ottawa River? Here, here, here. Yes, sure. Mr. Speaker, certainly the, the water levels in the Great Lakes are a cause for significant concern. Uh, the management of water is done through the uh, IJC, which is a joint panel between Canada and the United States. The IJC is looking actively at measures it may take to address some of those levels. We are certainly in conversation uh, with, with the IJC, and I believe that the IJC will actually be on the Hill to provide a briefing to, uh, to members uh, in the coming weeks. Honourable Member for Brentford Brent. Mr. Speaker. There is a backlog of over 44,000 veterans who are waiting for their disability benefit applications to be processed. Shame. Behind each one of these applications is a veteran trapped in a benefits backlog boondoggle of this government's own making. Many veterans have been waiting for over two years. When will the backlog be cleared? The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Uh, thank you, Honourable colleagues. Uh, question, and I can assure him that we're working very hard on this uh, backlog. And also, we invested just under $700 million into, I, into the operating budget last year. Mr. Speaker, what we're doing is digitizing the files. We're making sure that that uh, all veterans that should receive benefits receive benefits. Quite uh, uh, honestly, Mr. Speaker, there's a 60 percent increase totally in the applications because our government has been more generous to the veterans and 90 percent increase in, in, in the first uh, applications, Mr. Speaker. We have and will continue to support our veterans. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Brentford Brent. Mr. Speaker, it's sad but not surprising that the Minister can't answer since today at committee, he told us, quote, the department runs the department. There seems to be no plan, no plans to clear the backlog. And now it's questionable who is really in charge. Can the minister tell us when the backlog will be cleared or should we check with his deputy? The Honourable Minister. Speaker, and as I indicated in the committee today, that the, 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 the mental, uh, the money spent on, on mental health was not distributed properly. I directed the department to make sure that it was it was spent fairly, and to make sure that there, there was a review take place, and to make sure that it was spent just like it was over the last number of years. On the backlog, Mr. Speaker, we have invested a lot. Of, when when, the, when when my honourable colleague's government was in place, they fired uh, a thousand employees, cut the budget. And that is part of the reason why we're in the difficulty. The Honourable Member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the last few weeks, the International Trade Committee studied the Canada-U.S.-Mexico agreement, and we have heard from many businesses and stakeholders about various aspects of the agreement and the importance of its impact on our community. 
Can the Deputy Prime Minister tell us more about the next steps towards ratification and the importance of this agreement for all Canadians? Deputy Prime Minister. Indeed, I can. I would like to thank all the members of the International Trade Committee from all parties and their outstanding chair for their hard work in reviewing the new NAFTA. This agreement safeguards more than $2 billion a day in cross-border trade and tariff-free access for 99.9% .9 of our U.S.-bound exports. At a time when our economy and the global economy are facing significant challenges from the coronavirus, one thing that we can all do together that is entirely within our power is to support our economies to wrap the Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, Mayor Rick Bennett of Halton Hills and Mayor Gord Krantz of Milton, as well as mayors and representatives from across Halton Region are in Ottawa today to voice their opposition to the proposed truck hub, uh, hub in Milton, Ontario. A federal review panel said that this project will likely have a significant adverse impact on air quality and human health. Can the Liberal government update this House on their position on this project? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadians expect their government to make decisions that are thoughtful, that are based on science, evidence, and traditional knowledge that will uphold the government's commitment to protecting the environment while growing the economy. The report that has been brought forward uh, recently by the panel has now been submitted to the government. Our government has not made a decision. Uh, I will be thoroughly reviewing the panel's uh, recommendations as we go through the, the process, which is in the legislation of making that determination. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, I attended the BC Tree Fruits annual general meeting recently where I heard of the poor state of our apple growers. Many said they are near bankruptcy due to increasing costs and decreasing prices and the flooding of cheap apples across the border from the U.S. due to a trade dispute between the U.S. and China. To make matters worse, our apple, uh, apple farmers' exports to China have now been reduced and inventories are starting to pile up. What are the Liberals going to do to help our orchardists? Good question. Good question. The Honourable Minister for Agriculture. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know how important the 2019 was for our producers. It was so difficult for many reasons. There are a series of risk management programs to help our producers, and I would invite them to participate and sign up for those programs every year and to use them when necessary. Thank you. Member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Farmer, due to cancellations of federal processing and export licenses, it's been months since reading Regency closed with representing 10% of Ontario's beef industry processing industry. We've seen this government's inaction when it comes to helping our farmers. The carbon tax, the slow response to the rail blockades, and now trade disruptions mean Ontario's beef can't get to market. The Minister of Agriculture has done nothing to address this situation. When will the Minister act to resolve these critical processing challenges? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's crucial for our farmers and ranchers to access the value chain. We understand that the closure of this meat processing plant in Ontario has a significant impact on our cattle producers, but we cannot compromise on food safety. Our government is working with the industry and the province of Ontario to find short-term alternatives and to see how the meat processing capacity can be increased. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Moncton River Foods Yep. Member of Moncton Riverview and Dieppe, I've had the privilege of interacting with many members of the LGBTQ2 community. Yet nothing, and I stress nothing, has been more shocking to me than hearing accounts of anyone trying to change the core being of another person. That being that they cannot be their true selves. The evidence is clear. Conversion therapy is harmful and destructive. Can the Minister of Diversity, Inclusion and Youth tell the House what steps have been taken? to guarantee the prohibition on conversion therapy. The Honourable Minister of Diversity. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague from Moncton River Vudyep 
for her advocacy for LGBTQ2 Canadians. The most progressive legislation in the world here, here. when it comes to criminalizing conversion therapy. Conversion therapy is a harmful, disruptive practice that has no place in Canada. I applaud the provinces and municipalities that have already decided to ban this practice and I look forward to seeing more of that. I call on all members uh, to support this bill and to ensure that everyone everywhere in Canada can be who they truly are. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, after the worst Pacific wild salmon fishing season in recorded history, this government is simply not doing enough to support workers. Their failure to react to the crisis leaves commercial, recreational and Indigenous fishers in coastal BC desperate for support and action. And now the tourism industry in BC is seriously threatened by COVID-19. Will the Liberals urgently invest in a wild salmon relief package focused on restoration and help support fishers and workers in coastal communities. Yeah. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my Honourable Colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, we acknowledge that conservation measures, as well as COVID-19, has had significant negative impacts on our economy, as well as on harvesters, including a recreational sector. We're continuing to work with our partners and stakeholders to consider actions that help minimize the impacts while achieving the conservation efforts. We will continue to work with those groups to make sure that we meet these needs, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A recent report revealed that the claim that natural gas will displace coal and reduce greenhouse gas emissions came from an industry insider. He admits he neglected to include end-to-end -end life cycle emissions of fracked gas. In fact, fracked gas has the same greenhouse gas impact as burning coal. Fracking also contaminates air and water and causes earthquakes. Jurisdictions around the world have banned fracking. Will the government do the right thing and ban fracking in Canada? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hydraulic fracturing in Canada is strictly regulated and must be done using approved equipment and very specific procedures. As the Honourable Member, I'm sure, knows, the development and regulation of Canada's shale and tight and oil and gas reserves falls primarily within provincial jurisdiction. That's right. The Government of Canada is working with the provinces and territories to provide scientific and policy advice to support their policy and regulatory processes to ensure that any resource development occurs in a safe and environmentally responsible manner. Here, here. And that's all for today. C'est tout pour aujourd'hui.